Okay, <clears throat> let's give this a try. <clears throat> All right, my name is Cassandra Faye Floyd, also known as the Rogue Black Girl, also known as the Daughter of the Fates. So, I had this idea today, right? Um, I have been putting it off for some time, so I decided I was going to do a whole hair care day for myself. So I spent about three hours coloring my hair, right? And it literally took that long, right? And so after I got done coloring my hair, um, I'm going to tighten my hair. And um, so when I maintenance my hair, it's an all day event, usually takes about five hours um, to do my hair, right? To maintain my hair. And, um, and so I was thinking about when I fat, finally sat down to do it, I was thinking about this girl that I really like. I can't remember her name, but I like her little YouTube channel. And there's a couple other girls I've seen that way where they tell like horror stories or they tell like, you know, um, true stories of like serial killers and shit while doing their makeup. I was like, damn, that's cute. So when I sat here to get ready to do my hair, I, um, you know, there's this little uh, TikTok going around and it's like this little chick in the background singing, everything is content, everything is content. So I was like, well, fuck it. If everything is content, let me tell you guys a story while I do my hair. Now, the reason that I'm telling this story is because some of you may or may not know, I have a YouTube channel that I have been posting on pretty regularly since January, um, primarily around this book that we've been reading called The Great Cosmic Mother. But every time I uh, facilitate these discussions on our, um, our book club, I've always got like these stories because that's how I, you know, that's how I relay messages is through, you know, stories. Okay. So I'm always saying in these workshops, like, damn, I just need to do a whole, a whole separate channel where all I'm doing is telling these stories. So today is that attempt. So again, this is Cassandra. <clears throat> probably only going to do this for a few minutes, maybe, um, maybe 20, 30 minutes, um, just to see how it goes. And you guys can watch me maintain my hair while I tell you today's story, which is my first year with ayahuasca. So about two years ago, as a matter of fact, it was October of 2020. I had to go to, uh, to Alabama and to Florida and some other places. And um, the whole purpose of me going was to drive my daughter's car, pick her car up in Florida and drive her car to California. She and the babies had just gotten here and she needed her automobile. So I was like, this is a great opportunity for me to go visit, you know, check on the storage unit, whatever, whatever. So I found out that a friend of mine, Tahir, and his family were organizing this event. Um, it was an Oya masquerade ball on October 31st. I was like, this is awesome. I'm stuck here in California. I still don't have no Elay that I'm tied to. So I haven't been to a Bimbe in two years at that point. So I was like, all right, I'll just make this a, a whole big epic trip. Instead of making the trip, you know, going down there, getting the car and driving it back in two or three days. I was going to make a trip out of it. So I um, got my little outfit ready because it was a masquerade ball. I was going to go, be there a few days, and then drive back. I went to the Bimbe at this place called, uh, what's the name of this place? Um, the Bronze Kingdom. In um, It's on like International Drive in Disney World. Um, and it is amazing this like three or four story building with like all things Africa, African villages, like, like little mock African villages inside of it, an African museum, um, a whole like restaurant and bar and stay. It's just freaking phenomenal. Right. So I was like, all right, cool. So I go to this event. Um, it was an Oya masquerade slash bimbe. And I turn up because I'm like, all right, I'll sleep the next day and then I'll get ready to get on the road. So I turned up. I drank. I 
danced, I ate food, saw people I haven't seen in a few years. It was awesome. Plus, it was a bimbe. So, like, we went in. Okay. So, um, anyway, get there, turn up. And the next morning, I get a phone call from a friend of mine who lives in Atlanta. He says, you have to drive to Atlanta today. Now, from Orlando to Atlanta is a six-hour drive. I was like, bro, that is not like a small detour. That's like way, way out the way. I was like, what's so important that I need to come? Now, the backstory is this. So I've been in California now since 2018. And in California, you know, there's all kinds of little um, niches, niche, niches. Is that what it's called? Niches. And, you know, all kinds of little communities and cliques and things like that. But when I got out here, I'd say easily the great majority of people that I met and ended up in circles with were indigenous people, were Native American people and were Mexican, South American folk. Right. So, um, you know, there were a few people, a few white people that I had um come into contact with, befriended, if you will, um, as a a consequence of political work that we were doing. But the majority, great, great, great majority of the folks that I've known and continue to know out here are indigenous, right? And so, you know, the psychedelic thing out here is really big. And so I had been hearing a lot about ayahuasca And it sounded really interesting, you know, and then I'm in the medical profession. So when I started hearing all of these studies coming out of the psychological community about um, this being implicated in um, helping resolve addiction issues primarily, um, also post-traumatic stress disorder, I was like, damn, this is fascinating. So, but the, the disclaimer was, was that I don't go into ceremony with white people and that is that is my thing for right now. I don't know that that will be for forever, but for right now, I don't go into ceremony with white people. And so because the only people that I had been hearing talk about ayahuasca were white folks, I was like, okay, I guess it ain't nothing that's for me, right? That's the backstory. I had already conceded and made up in my mind that I would stick with mushrooms when I wanted, um, when I wanted to go into ceremony. Okay. Fast forward to this reason that this, this dude called me and asked me, or actually demanded that I make a six hour detour to Atlanta. So this brother, um, had been going to Peru for, I think he said seven years for seven years, twice a month, he would go to Peru and do ayahuasca, sit in ayahuasca ceremony. And since, and he was just talking about how much it had changed his life and how, you know, his biggest wish is for black people in Atlanta to have, you know, to have access to this medicine without having to go to Peru to have the experience, right? So, you know, he had gone twice a year for seven years, changed his life, And he was like, I asked my teacher for permission to facilitate um, ceremony here in Atlanta. Um, And he said, yes, sent me the medicine, whatever, whatever. Um, And he was like, you got to come. Tomorrow's the last day. So when I came, I went ahead and took the detour because I was like, this has got to be serendipity. He was only facilitating for black people in Atlanta for the seven days. Okay. So when I get there and I'm expecting that it's going to be a group of us um, doing ayahuasca, he had already been facilitating for seven days. And so the day that I was coming was the last day. This is November 1st of 2020. Okay. I need to make this the story shorter, but there's a lot of stuff that's important anyway. So I drive there now, mind you, um, there was no preparation time. You know, I didn't know anything about ayahuasca except what I'd been reading. I hadn't watched any videos on people's ayahuasca experience. 
right? I didn't know anything about the dieta that is required um, for sometimes weeks before you sit in ceremony with this plant, right? So I'm just barreling down the highway, six hours out the way from Atlanta, I mean, from Orlando to Atlanta after partying all night with, with you know, with the goddess Oya, like all night till three o'clock in the morning. And I get up there and uh, <clears throat> it's like, as soon as I walk in the door, he's like, all right, you ready? And I'm like, whoa. Anyway, so we get ready. He's got the setup in his living room. It's just me and him because everybody else has gone through their ceremony. So anyway, <clears throat> this is my first experience with this plant that is being facilitated by this brother who, um, you know, in my mind, you know, knows what he's doing. He's done it, you know, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times, facilitated, whatever, whatever. So I think this story is important to tell because I sense having done ayahuasca um, and I did ayahuasca that year, uh, 2020, October, well, November 1st, 2020 through May, I think it was like May 5th of 2021. I did ayahuasca five times between October and May and I haven't done it again. Um, and I think it's important for a number of reasons to tell this story because like I since have watched the videos of people talking about their ayahuasca experience. I um, have sat in ceremony with other people doing ayahuasca since the first time and, um, and I've done it by myself. And, you know, so I'm going to be approaching this from a couple of angles because I feel like there was my first experience was epic, by the way. It was but I will say it was epic and equally terrifying. I um, that first session, that first that first <laughs> meeting with ayahuasca forever changed me forever, ever, ever changed me. Okay. And, and so that is powerful. There was so much that happened that made so much of my life, like crystal clear. However, like there was, um, in hindsight, you know, there are, so many social, spiritual, um, physical health implications that people don't talk about enough when talking about their experience with ayahuasca. I've watched hours and hours and hours. I've read so many articles on ayahuasca, you know, the peer reviewed journal articles about, you know, the the chemical, the active con chemical constituents and, you know, what they do and what the path, um, what the path is, you know, from a chemical, biochemical standpoint of what is happening, um, what the dangers and precautions are, everything, right? But let me tell you something. I know a lot of people here who do ayahuasca, and this is a disclaimer. <clears throat> this is not a judgment. I am not trying to pass judgment on anybody. Everybody's journey is their own and all you can do is hope that your experiences can have an impact or at least inform someone else before, you know, going the same route. For me, <clears throat> all the things that I have since read and watched about people's experiences, the thing that stood out for me was um, <laughs> I kept asking myself, I was like, are, are people doing the same plant I'm doing? Like, <laughs> to listen to people's experience on this medicine and to see how sharp 
the contrast is from my experiences. And I've listened to a lot of different experiences from a lot of different types of people, right? But I'm every time I'm just like, damn, they ain't do the same medicine. They didn't do the same medicine I did. They ain't take the same, they eat the same plant I ate. You, you feel me? And and I'm laughing about it because I can in hindsight, but nothing prepared me for what happened with with my walk with this medicine. There was nothing that anyone has said, like I said, I didn't do a lot of research before, but even subsequent to, there wasn't a lot that people were saying that would have prepared me for what I experienced when I sat with that medicine. And so I had to start really thinking about what, what happens when you have a relationship, you know, or you have a, you have a go round with any, you know, any plant that um, is supposed to, you know, create in you uh, the ability to, um, to have deep, deep and profound spiritual insight. Right. So um, I'm going to tell you, you know, it's kind of my soapbox. I know that it annoys some of the people that I run with, but <clears throat> worldview is everything. We are, and I say it often, I know, but we are and have been so conditioned to to see the world in such a linear and myopic and undialectical way that it, <clears throat> that, that, that that thinking makes it impossible for us, makes it difficult, I won't say impossible, but makes it really difficult for us to, to, ha- to live, to have, a, to have real breakthroughs. We have experiences, but we don't have often like seriously profound breakthroughs. And the difference between an experience and a breakthrough is a breakthrough is something that forever changes how you see the world, how you relate to the world, how you relate to others in it, how you move, how you present in the world is transformed. There's no choice. It's transformed by breakthrough. Right. And so when I was listening to friends and acquaintances talk about and even strangers talk about ayahuasca and the other methods of, um, you know, spiritual journeying, if you will, that people are into at any given time in history. Right. Um, right now, it's San Pedro and it's Cambo and it's, you know, mushrooms and it's um you know, DMT and all of these things, right? Um, And I always, not always, but yeah, for a long time, had always been um, rubbed the wrong way, but couldn't articulate why I was having these experiences when hearing people talk about um, these psychedelics. And um, the reason you know, in hindsight, that I was frustrated with how these discussions were happening or unfolding is again, because of worldview. So worldview and, you know, and being dialectic and being um, undogmatic and being, um, and being able to see the way with which every aspect of your life fits into a puzzle as opposed to just seeing something spiritually or just seeing something scientifically or just experiencing something, you know, socially or whatever, how all of those things make up our current worldview. And we take that with us everywhere. We take that with us into every scenario. It doesn't matter spiritually, politically, culturally, socially, historically, who you are goes with you into every scenario. So it goes into, you know, if you're going to a a demonstration, it goes with you. If you are, you know, going to a rock show, it goes with you everywhere. It's part of your entire, you know, your entire being. And so the reason 
that I would preface to friends of mine why I didn't go into ceremony with white people is because historically, especially with the tradition that I ascribe to, Ifa, we believe that our ancestors are ever present, ever living, ever having an impact on our life, right? That they are just as alive now as they were when they were alive in the flesh, just different. And so if I go into a ceremony, if I go into a nipi, or I go into some hut somewhere and I am going to be vulnerable because I am being opened up by some plant, the spirit of some plant, child, listen, and I'm going in and everywhere I go, I come into a space shrouded with my ancestors. That don't have to be your belief. It's mine. And I know it to be real, right? And so that is a problem, at least right now. That's a problem because white people come into a space the same way. That's what I believe, right? And so without having created yet a world where um, those differences are reconciled. The differences that my ancestors, both Native and African, um, can have some reconciliation, some redemption for the differences that they have with white people's ancestors. I can't go in, I cannot go into a space that private, that personal with white people. Now I can do everything else. I go out, I hang out, I go to your house, we kick it. But that's that's the one place where that boundary from right now, right, is non-negotiable, right? And so when I, um, you know, these things are important to mention because <laughs> just like I am talking about not going into a space um, because I ain't coming in there by myself. I'm coming there with all my ancestors. I'm coming in there with all their frustration, their rage, you understand? Their despair, their grief. I'm carrying all that shit in there with me. Attempting to not only heal myself and the life of my child and the life of my grandchildren and my mama, those that are living around me that can benefit from the walk that I'm on, but also to undo or resolve the damage done to my bloodline. That shit is real because time is not linear, you see. Their pain still exists, you understand, right? Until it's resolved, until it's reconciled. Their pain is still ever present and real in the world, okay? So when I say that, you know, and I talk about bringing, you know, bringing your full self into ceremony, especially when you're sitting with something sacred, some plant or whatever. Um, that's why, <clears throat> that's why my experiences have been so vastly different than other people that I've heard talk about, you know, how they have had their experiences with this medicine. Now, I know I'm sounding like I'm being cryptic, but I am not. Because when I first did ayahuasca, the first thing I said was everybody in Ifa needed to sit with this plant at least once. All right? I said, everybody I ever knew in the tradition needs to sit with this plant. You understand? I said, damn, I know, I, I just know too many people who need to sit with this plant. Right? Now, the problem is not even a problem. But the, the deal is this. When I went into ayahuasca... And I had the experiences that I had. Um, I talk with my hands, so it was difficult for me to do this little cute shit like these girls be doing, you understand? But um, when I sat with the medicine, I took my life, my social, my social upbringing, my worldview, my political worldview, right? My cultural and social worldview my spiritual worldview and all the past spiritual experiences that I've had, even before I became a practitioner of E5 as an atheist, you know what I'm saying? As a, you know, a devout Christian born in a Christian cult, right? So these are all experiences that come into ceremony with you. You understand? And baby, 
I'm reading this article before I got on this before I got on this live about you know the complexities of um, of what is you know basically spiritual tourism, right? Um, ayahuasca is just the new is just the new you know um, the new site for uh, Western spiritual tourism, but this has been an ongoing pattern for many 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 years, right? And um, and so they're just talking about like, you know, while people might need, you know, the spiritual clarity and enlightenment or they may need the healing or the help that comes from ayahuasca, um, the social circumstances make it a very precarious situation. One, it creates um, it, the, the tourism see, being seen as a new industry in a country that has a lot of uh, contradictions created by the West. These contradictions created by the West have put people in a position where they have to now sell the traditions of their ancestors to be able to make a living, right? To be able to live. One. Two, that industry creates the opportunity for charlatans um, to fake being, you know, shaman and healers and what have you that can administer this medicine. The, um, you know, then the, so the isolation of how these, you know, these, these ceremonies happen, at least in, in South America, where you're off in the middle of nowhere, you know, with a bunch of people you don't know and may not even speak the language of, um, opening up, opening up the opportunity for, um, for abuses to take place especially by said, said, um, said charlatans, right? Um, but I want to go deeper because intention has a lot to do with what you receive from medicine. Um, when people talk about ayahuasca and call her mama ayahuasca and they talk about how, you know, she came to them and she showed them something, I am willing to bet that these, the experience, the spiritual experience that the indigenous people of South America have with this plant, when they sit in ceremony with this plant, with their kinsmen, right? I am willing to bet a million dollars that their experience is wildly different than the experience that some person from Switzerland has when doing that me that medicine because you're social and cultural the ideas your experience in the world your experience in your past lives all of these things create um an experience that would be alien to the person facilitating and vice versa right and so we you go into ayahuasca and i get it i get the i get the I get the need for tradition and this is how it's always been done. But we're also talking about a goddamn revolutionary process we're going through. This is me just thinking out loud. And so when I go into this, this brother's house, he sets up the place as if we, you know, in a hut in Peru somewhere. And that's cool. He's got these big ass Peruvian paintings with the, the damn hummingbirds all over the place. And he's got playing on his surround sound system traditional like real ayahuasca ceremonial um, recordings done in an actual ayahuasca ceremony in South America. So you hear the old guy playing on the instruments and the woman singing in the background of the guy and the woman alternate or whatever. And so it is supposed to create this atmosphere that is similar uh, to elicit a certain, um, you know, a certain experience, right? And I get it, right? But for me, it's like, if, if, if living near the Amazon in Peru with tribal people is not my, um, my social, cultural, lived experience and worldview, then how much am I going to relate to this environment that is attempting to be set for me um, to get the most from what I need in a relationship with this plant? Or even deeper than that, the plant is indigenous to 
this area, this Amazon, you know, Amazon close proxim proximal area in Peru. Now, when people talk about spirits, of, so y'all know I'm an herbalist, right? Um, and, you know, so I was always intrigued by stories of great herbalists of the past, great healers of the past, who were said to have such an intimate relationship with the plants that they could fast for a few days, or, you know, or whatever, and go out into the woods and all they had to do was sit with the plants uh, with a pen and a piece of paper and they could hear the plants talking and the plants would say, this is what we good for. This is what we can heal. This is what we use for. You can eat us. You can't eat us. Like I was always intrigued by stories like that. And there are many, many stories like this that exist in different cultures of people who were so quiet and so in tune with the spirit of plants that they could talk to the plants, right? Um, one story, since, you know, I um, went to school for Chinese medicine, the, um, the great herbalist Shenong um, was, um, he was basically a hermit, but he, um, you know, he would have these relationships with plants and stuff and intuit uh, what the plants were used for. And then he would eat the plant or the medicine until it made him sick. And then all of the... Um, all of the um, symptoms that he displayed by eating too much of the plant are the symptoms that the plant in small doses would heal. Brilliant, right? We're like, he was so close and so in tune with the plants that the plants could not distinguish him from self. The plants would grow on his body like he was part of the plants, right? Awesome. I used to love these stories, right? But there's something to it. If... Shenong, for example, was able to sit out in the wilderness for 40 days and, you know, be one with the plants so that he could learn the secrets of the plants. The plants could talk to him and tell him the current materia medica that we still use in acupuncture today, right now today, is the works of Shenong some 6,000 years ago, right? It hasn't changed much. And so um, if this, you know, if this is a period where there was quiet, right? And um, and even though, you know, mankind has always been in conflict with one another, the conflicts weren't all the time ongoing, at, at unending in shit, right? You had time to think. You had times of peace, long periods of quiet and peace and stillness and shit, right? And so, and, and the, the planet wasn't being polluted and desecrated and shit in mass. So when you talk about doing ayahuasca in South America, like spiritual tourists do because they feel like it's the most authentic you know, experience that they can have. But when the plant grows in a, in a state of duress, in my estimation, grows in a state of duress because Peru the Amazon and indigenous people of the area are under constant attack by Westerners looking to either steal the natural aquifers, water sources, or, you know, um, uh, destroy the land for cattle grazing or and doing, you know, horrible shit to facilitate these things. Murder is big. It's common for Western companies, corporations to um, facilitate hits on big environmental activists in these areas, right? So if the people and the plants grow together and there is a relationship, and there is, between us and plant life on this planet, not just the people in Peru with ayahuasca, everywhere we are, our emotions, our experiences are having an impact, whether negative or positive, on the plant life around us, on the water around us, right? And so for me, I'm thinking about this plant. I'm always in my feelings when I hear about people saying, okay, I'm going to do ayahuasca again. They do ayahuasca every month or every two weeks or whatever. And I'm like, why do you need to do ayahuasca that much? Why do you need to do ayahuasca every month? 
every every 10 days, every 15, 20 days. Why do you need that? Because if you haven't experienced breakthrough yet, right? Then something something is missing. There's a link that is missing. Now, that's my position. My position is that we never sit still long enough to take into account all of these ways and all of these relationships and all these strands of the web that come together to create or to allow us to meet at this point that we we need to meet at, right? And um, and so, baby, when I say I did ayahuasca five times from October, well, November 1st, 2020, um, to, um, to May 5th, 2021. So what, maybe 10 months, right? Something like that. Yeah, maybe 10 months. No, seven months. And, um, and each time was so profound. It was like, it was so, pro- you know how, shit. Anyway, it was so profound. So, so, so profound. The last time I did it, I was like, I'm never doing it again. I'm never, I'm never doing it again. Right. And the the woman that was facilitating for me, she was like, you may need to do it again, but you can't do it in the traditional way. She said, you may need to be outside. You may, you may need different music. You, The first person I've ever heard say that. And she's traditional. She was like, you can't do it like everybody. You can't be in a group setting. You'll never be able to do it again in a group setting. She said, you're going to have to be by yourself with your facilitator or two. And you're going to have to have different music. And you're going to need to be outside. You can't You can't be seated. You can't be laying down. And I had intuited that. I was like, uh-uh. Mm-mm. 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 I got to be, I got to make sure I'm on earth. I have to make sure that I am still in my body. Right. Uh, I'm, I know this is like disjointed or whatever, but look, I'm just telling you as, as black people, as, um, as indigenous people from other places, you know, um, as Asian people, and even as white people who are open to hear, because that's the, that's, that's the key phrase for them is you have to be open to hear, um, your money, you know, the fact that we are able or um, that spiritual tourism is a thing, to me, is problematic. It impedes the journey, right? Um, to me, um, it impedes the journey, right? Um, and, you know, to just be able to go and, quote, purchase this experience on a whim um, is part of the issue. The fact that the plants um, on this planet are in crisis, and they are, um, to me, changes the matrix of these plants. It changes, you know, it's not just about active constituents in a plant that make the plant do what it do. Yeah, we can sit here and look at the, the pathways of how, you know, the ayahuasca, you know, affects the dopamine levels and, you know, whatever, you understand? But there is something deeper than just that the pathogenesis of how this, this plant works chemically in the body. Right. And, um, and I'm telling you, it's those unseen and those unspoken that have the greatest impact. I feel like, um, plant medicine in general, um, and I'm not, I want to be clear. I recognize that the people in South America are, put in a situation where this is what they have to do to live. So I want to be careful about how I say what I got to say. Um, I think that people have a right to do what they need to do to survive, uh, especially given whatever their circumstances are. Um, I'm saying for those of us who are, who say that we are seriously looking for breakthrough, that we're really trying to understand our role in the grand scheme of things, what is being required of us and we see that plant medicine and ceremony offers the ability to do that, 
then you are hindering your journey if you do not pay attention, one, to colored people. You got to be able, because that's part of all of our work. But white people have this extraordinarily inflated sense of self because those that are in power need that of them to maintain things the way that they are. So yes, the everyday regular white person has to have an extraordinarily aggrandized sense of self in order for shit to be maintained the way that it is, right? And so the hardest thing for a person to do um, that has an overbloated um, sense of self a malignant uh, sense of self, the hardest thing to do is to listen to some colored person. <laughs> the hardest thing to do is to listen to some co some colored person. You understand? Um, and, to, and the degree to which you will listen to a colored person is the degree that you still think you, you're the smartest person in the room. You understand? And um, you see yourself as somehow progressive because you listen to this particular colored person um, or other, Right? And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, being able to, um, to, you know, relinquish control and listen to people who are your cultural, social, historical elders about what they're experiencing in space with you and being able to not be triggered by what they say, but to be open to hear what it is they say, right? And so um, all of that is about how being open, right? My prayer constantly for years now, when I was driving across the country for six weeks, my prayer constantly, like chanting it like a mantra, Allow me to be open to receive whatever it is you have for me, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Allow me, spirit, to allow me, spirit, to be open to what you have for me, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Whatever it is you need me to, to know or experience, allow me to be open to it, even if it makes me uncomfortable. This is where breakthrough is. This is where breakthrough is. Going into a space, an open vessel, just ready to learn ready to accept an experience, right? It's still my prayer because that's where the magic is. That's where the mystery is, right? And um, and so, you know, to me, it's, it's an impossibility. The kind of breakthrough that I had on that medicine, it is impossible to get that. That's not to say that you won't have powerful, powerful experiences. It's not to say that you won't experience epiphany because you will. But I'm telling you, the meeting of your past self in real time, the staring down at yourself before you chose this life and remembering why you chose it. <laughs> the chat, listen, I'm just trying to tell you that there is an earnesty. And there is a relinquishing that has to happen before breakthrough can take hold, child. You understand? And I'm just going to tell you, this ain't even the story. Because I was going to tell you actually, word for word and shit, what happened in the ceremony because it was profound. But the, I had to preface. And the preface is 43 minutes long, so I'm going to probably stop here soon. And I'm going to have to save that story for another day. But let me just tell you. The medicine is important. But the intentions going into it, being clear about what you want to receive from it. I had a young man tell me, um, yeah, but I'm not ready to do ayahuasca yet. I want to. He's, but this young white kid, he said, but um, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to face my ancestors yet. That's what he said. He said, I am not ready to do this medicine yet because I am not ready to face my ancestors yet. I am not ready to go that deep yet. I know I need to, but I, I'm not ready right now. That's some profound shit. That's some honest and profound shit, right? 
I don't know what happened to my, um, yeah, I, whatever. Something happened to my IG live. But anyway, that is, that's an honest statement. But he's a 22-year-old kid. You understand what I'm saying? Um, but baby, that's the work. Um, if you are going into ceremony, for to me, maybe the, maybe it's a hell of a statement. For me, if you're going into ceremony, if you're doing plant medicine, if you're doing anything like that, for any other reason than to change the world, then it is recreation. What's the point of spiritual enlightenment if it's not to change the world? What is the point of, of spiritual epiphany, radical breakthrough, if it is not to change the world? We are a part of the world that is suffering right now. We are intimately woven in it. We are not outside it. Our spiritual, our spiritual experiences are not apart from it. It is so deeply ingrained and interwoven, you cannot see the breaks of light in between. So what is our spiritual experiences for? What are they for? What are our, What is epiphany for? What, what is it that you're trying to see? What is it that you're trying to do when you have these experiences with, these, with this medicine? You want to talk to Mother Earth for what? You understand what I'm saying? You want to have, you know, you want to have a powwow with your ancestors for what? You understand? You want to, you know, you want to get deep and, you know, deep and esoteric with the, your spirit guides to what end? For what? This, like, this is the period in human history where it becomes crystal clear that all roads, everything that we do has to lead to evolution. And what I mean by evolution is the radical transformation of the planet and all of its inhabitants. That's what I'm talking about. I am talking about an integration of the past, the present, and the future. An integration. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, some freaking time capsule leap backwards back into the grand old age. I'm talking about the lessons, the knowledge, you know, the experiences of the past, the potential of the future in real time. Like this is what breakthrough is. Right. And um, I guess that's all I got to say, because. That totally went a different way. And I only got a little bit done <laughs> while talking to y'all because I have to master the art of not talking with my hands when I'm doing shit. But I still think it's a cute idea. Y'all give me some feedback. Tell me what you think. Should I just bypass um, trying to do my hair like these girls do their makeup and then tell y'all funny stories? I do have funny stories. I'm not serious all the time. I'm actually pretty funny. And I'm going to tell you funny stories. But today I really wanted to talk about this ayahuasca thing. Um. And I'm probably going to have to tell you another story just so I can tell you what happened in ayahuasca, what what I was shown in ayahuasca, because it's like I said, it permanently changed me. I'm forever changed. So anyway, um, maybe another day. But in the meantime, this Cassandra, daughter of the fates, rogue black girl. Um, tune in on another day. All right.